Hi, everyone. We're very excited to be here today uh, to talk to you about a new paper that's dropping from the White Group in PNAS. Uh, we affectionately call this P450 in a bottle. As many of you may know, uh, the atomistic change of CH to CO can dramatically alter the function of complex molecules. In many cases, it can turn on the potency as shown here with taxol. These remarkable atomistic changes are done routinely using heme enzymes, uh, typically P450 enzymes, which are ubiquitous in nature. They're found in trees, in bacteria, and they're found in us. So if you take a drug, uh, the drug passes through your liver, which is very rich in cytochrome P450 enzymes, and this introduces oxygen. This oxygen makes the molecule more water soluble, which allows you to excrete it from your body. In some cases, this also can alter the biological activity of the compound. It can make it more toxic, or as in the case of pyroglitin, it can make it into a more potent drug. This inspired us to conceive of the idea of late stage oxidation in 2005. The concept is like nature does, if we could install oxygen at very late stages of complex molecule synthesis, we could streamline the synthesis by not having to carry this reactive functionality throughout the synthesis. We could also like nature does take complex scaffolds and change their function. Now in 2005, such chemistry didn't exist. And so we went on to invent such chemistry. And interestingly, what we discovered, these iron and manganese PDP catalysts look nothing like a P450, but in fact, act a lot like a P450 as you're gonna see here today. Mechanistically, they're thought to operate like a P450 does through a iron or manganese oxo. And they're also thought to go through a very late product-like transition state where very subtle differences between the environment of CH bonds like electronics, steric, stereoelectronics can impact where the oxidation happens. Finally, these oxidations are able to be performed on preparative amounts of substrate. And the reason for this is how the functionalization happens. So as soon as this iron hydroxide forms, it's thought to rapidly recombine with the transient intermediate here, so much so that if this were a tertiary CH bond that were stereochemically defined, the hydroxylation would be stereospecific. So this oxidant is thought to be a very electrophilic oxidant. So it oxidizes the most electron rich CH bond in a molecule irrespective of BDEs. You can make the catalyst more sensitive to sterics as is done with the CF3 PDP catalyst. And so you can oxidize secondary CH bonds in the presence of tertiary. You can take advantage of stereoelectronic activation. Here I'm showing hyperconjugative activation that directs oxidation. And finally, we think that it's crucial to have a acid present when forming this oxo, which leads to a metal oxo carboxylate. You can replace the carboxylic acid with a carboxylic acid in your molecule, and this has a very potent directing effect to form butyrolactones. Very excitingly, all of these CH oxidation rules have now been demonstrated for other types of oxidants that proceed through late product-like transition states. And they've also been demonstrated at very late stages in complex molecule diversification. Here I'm showing you artemisinin, which benefits from electronic activation, and broxide, which undergoes hyperconjugative activation to form sclerolide. This gibberellic acid analog without acetic acid in the reaction mixture gives butyrolactone derivatized product, and finally pleuromutilin, an antibiotic, now benefits from both electronic, steric, and stereoelectronic activation to hit one of the strongest CH bonds in this molecule very selectively. So collectively, these led to the first examples of late stage functionalization in the literature. And since that time, we've been very excited to see leaders in the field of complex molecule synthesis that have used these concepts and these catalysts to be able to streamline total syntheses and to diversify them. 
And so what are the future challenges in this field? One of the ones that, that we're going to be talking to you about, um, in addition to being able to divert site selectivity in complex molecules, we're very excited about expanding the chemoselectivity of these reactions to be able to tolerate functionality that normally would get rapidly oxidized with such a strong oxidant. So for example, you can imagine if you have electron rich nitrogen functionality in your molecule, that's gonna be more prone to oxidation with an oxidant that can oxidize a very strong methylene CH bond. So we found that by promoting protonating very electron rich heterocycles such as pyridine with HBF4, we could deactivate them to some extent towards oxidation and affect now this remote, uh, very strong bond methylene CH oxidation. However, we found that if you have other pi systems in your molecule under this iron catalysis, it becomes oxidized. And so what we discovered is that by switching out the iron metal for a manganese metal, we now had a much more chemoselective oxidant that could tolerate pi systems in aromatics and even alkynes that are moderately electronically deactivated. Interestingly, as we're looking at all of these remarkable natural product functionalizations with these catalysts, we also begin to notice something else that's very intriguing, uh, which is that in many cases, P450 enzymes will oxidize at the same site on very similar types of scaffolds. And so collectively, this got us to think about a new project, which was can we use the manganese CF3 PDP catalysis in combination with the HBF4 protection strategy now to significantly impact pharmaceutical chemistry? And how would we do that? Well, it turns out remarkably, uh, roughly 59% of all small molecules contain nitrogen heterocycles. And an emerging trend in pharmaceutical chemistry is to replace aromatics on these heterocycles with small carbocycles. This is thought to both increase the solubility of the molecules and also alter their potency. Even though this is potentially a really exciting new direction in pharmaceutical chemistry, many medicinal chemists do not use the strategy. And the reason I think is pretty clear, it's much easier to diversify aromatic compounds than it is to diversify carbocycles. In fact, if you want to diversify a carbocycle, typically you have to start with a pre-installed functional group, which often doesn't allow you to make use of powerful cross-coupling chemistry to install it in into the heterocycle, and you have to go through relatively lengthy de novo synthesis to do this. Additionally, if you now incorporate a carbocycle, you introduce new aliphatic sites of metabolism into your molecule, as is shown here with this, this uh, antipsychotic blenanserin and penconazole, this fungicide. And so now with these aliphatic metabolites, what we observe is that in order to be able to make enough of the metabolite to definitively ID it and also to test its biological activity, again, medicinal chemists have to go through very lengthy de novo syntheses. Now for decades, chemists have been trying to mimic this activity of cytochrome P450 on such molecules to be able to do the dream reaction, which is directly take this molecule and install these uh, oxidized metabolites. Well, what we see is that even in very modern versions of such attempts, that the reaction is not usually preparative and also has very limited tolerance for such really important, important moieties such as heterocycles. And so we thought about this project and we got uh, a very, very talented graduate student from Australia, Rachel Chambers, to agree to take this on. And so uh, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel, who's going to talk to you about, uh, about this project. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. Um, and so I, I began this work by exploring our manganese CF3 PDP catalyst with our HBF4 nitrogen protection strategy to evaluate heterocycle scope in methylene oxidation. And so we were really excited to see that we can tolerate heterocycles of a broad range of basicities from ones that have very high basicity, which is denoted here by high pKaH, 
to ones with very low basicity denoted with a lower pKaH. And so it's really significant to note that most heterocycles, even uh, pretty non-basic heterocycles, benefit from our HBF4 protonation strategy. However, when the heterocycle becomes very non-basic, such as tetrazole, HBF4 protonation is not beneficial. And so working with a very talented younger graduate student, Jake Weaver, we found that we can tolerate 25 distinct heterocycles, including 14 out of 27 of the top heterocycles found in drugs. Um, we're also able to tolerate a variety of drugs and drug derivatives. And so this enabled us for the first time to systematically evaluate our previous observation that we often oxidize with our small molecule catalyst at the same site as cytochrome P450 enzymes. And so I next moved on to evaluating a series of drug bioisosteres where changing from an aromatic group to a saturated carbocycle resulted in increased potency for these small molecule drug candidates. And we are really excited to find that we uh, observe good to excellent yields for aliphatic oxidation using manganese CF3 PDP catalysis with these drug bioisosteres. We we're even more excited to find that uh, by collaborating uh, with Shane Kersker and Jason Hoare at Merck, we found that these bioisosteres are oxidized in the same place with cytochrome P450 enzymes as we see with our manganese CF3 PDP catalysis. We uh, additionally wanted to evaluate manganese CF3 PDP's ability to rapidly generate aliphatic metabolites of this antipsychotic drug, flunanserin. And so as previously noted, it took uh, five to nine step syntheses to identify the aliphatic metabolites of flunanserin. Um, and we wondered if we would be able to directly oxidize this core structure um, and streamline metabolite synthesis. So working with my colleague, a visiting professor, uh, Jin Ho Kim, who developed a large scale low catalyst loading procedure, we were able to do a multi-gram scale oxidation of, on the blunanserin core that yielded over a gram of this blunanserin precursor at the same size as the cytochrome P450 enzymes oxidized. And so we were able to rapidly elaborate this core by reducing to alcohol to form both of the metabolites, as well as fluorinating and methylating these analogs of lanancerin. Um, and it's also really interesting to note that we were able to use the group's previously developed oxidative methylation strategy to install these methyl groups. And so I'll now hand this over to Jake, who will discuss with you how this method compares to previous oxidation methods for accessing metabolites and derivatizing pharmaceuticals containing nitrogen heterocycles. Yeah, so we were interested in evaluating manganese CF3 PDP oxidations um, on substrates that have been previously demonstrating using um, previous state-of-the-art CH oxidation methods. Uh, the fungicide penconazole was previously shown to undergo electrochemical CH oxidation at both C2 and C3 um, in 26% uh, overall yield on a 0.3 millimole scale. What we found is that using manganese CF3 PDP, uh, we were able to perform uh, methylene CH oxidation on penconazole on a 1.1 gram scale uh, to afford 38% yield of the exclusive uh, C2 product, which is a metabolic site for this uh, fungicide. Additionally, uh, the buspirone and teospirone metabolite precursor um, was previously shown to undergo electrochemical CH oxidation uh, to afford this precursor in 47% uh, in yield uh, using two recycles on a 0.3 millimole scale. Uh, we were able to oxidize 1.45 grams of this material to afford this metabolite precursor in 74% yield um, in only one reaction. Um, and as Christina previously mentioned, um, the uh, lin uh, pharmaceutical linrotostat um, previously required a synthesis using a pre-oxidized starting material um, involving multiple protection deprotection steps. Um, what we were able to show is that combining um, uh, powerful SP2, SP3 cross couplings, um, we were able to um, append on this unfunctionalized carbocycle and then undergo methylene CH oxidation using manganese CF3 PDP to afford the linrotostat precursor without any sort of functional group manipulation. 
Um, we were also interested in kind of will we question whether the uh, substrate scope afforded with manganese CF3PDP expands the diversity of substrates for methylene CH oxidation of N heterocyclic molecules in the context of both pharmaceutical chemical space and as well as in comparison to previous CH oxidation systems. And so to answer this question, we decided to use chemoinformatic tools um, to carry out sort of a, a chemical space mapping strategy. So what we did is we obtained a pharmaceutical uh, data set from Kemble and combined this with both the substrates from our work in this paper, as well as previously reported and heterocyclic substrates um, that have undergone methylene CH oxidation. We then featureized all of these molecules using a topological fingerprint and then performed a UMAP visualization in order to visualize chemical space of all of these molecules. What we found is that previous to the substrates uh, demonstrated in this work, um, previous methods tended to, uh, to show limited structural diversity of their substrate scope. And in terms of the pharmaceutical chemical space they were accessing, it tended to be in sparsely occupied regions. Um, and on many of these molecules would uh, tightly cluster with each other. Um, upon the addition of substrates from this work, what we found is that the uh, diversity of chemical space coverage was vastly improved. And we were now accessing novel regions of chemical space that also contained um, kind of the most densely populated regions. We looked into this a little bit further, and what we ultimately found is that these novel regions also tend to contain molecules of both the highest molecular weight and highest complexity. I'll hand it back to Christina. All right. Thank you guys uh, so much for doing such a great job presenting this work. We just want to end, of course, by thanking all of our funders for this work where this wouldn't be possible without them. Uh, the NIGMS, Merck, um, as well as this NSF AI Institute for uh, support with the chemoinformatic analyses. Um, we want to end on, on just saying again, um, we're very excited about the potential of this small molecule catalyst now that is very readily available. It's commercially available to be used uh, as a uh, cytochrome P450 mimic, uh, to be able to rapidly access metabolites, as well as be able to um, access sites that normally would be metabolized and be able to diversify them and uh, potentially add functionality like fluorine and methyl uh, that could block metabolism. So thanks so much for joining in. If you guys have any questions about the work, uh, including operational questions of how to run the reaction, we would love to get those kinds of questions. And please feel free uh, to email me directly, uh, and I can pass uh, the questions on to the students. So thanks again. Bye.